In the past, if we've wanted to help someone to lose weight with medications, our options were fairly limited. That is, until drugs like Ozempic came along, offering some of the first meaningfully effective therapeutics to help break down some of the barriers to weight loss. But what's the evidence that these drugs actually work? How long do they work for? What happens when someone comes off of these drugs? And importantly, how are these drugs different from those of the past? We'll talk about how these drugs target some of the very sites that drive weight gain over the course of a lifetime, and that starts in the brain. Some of the most important changes as someone gains weight throughout a lifetime are effectively invisible, and those include inflammatory changes within the brain like gliosis and scarring, and even disruption of normal neurological signaling that keeps our weight in check. But fortunately, we've learned that there are certain levers or switches that we can pull within the brain to facilitate weight loss. We now have some of the first meaningfully effective drugs that act on those levers, including drugs like Ozempic. These drugs are the GLP-1 receptor agonists, including semaglutide, which is marketed as Wegovy, and loraglutide. In the body, these drugs are trying to mimic the effects of a hormone called GLP-1, and they do that by mimicking its shape and binding to its receptor. So then, where does GLP-1 come from, and what does it do? GLP-1, or glucagon-like peptide 1, is a chain of amino acids produced by a type of cell in the intestinal tract called the L cells. GLP-1 acts as a messenger to allow our gut to communicate with our brain and the rest of our body. For example, GLP-1 sensitizes a certain type of cell in the stomach that detects stretching, like after we eat food, and it delays the emptying of the stomach. It also plays a critical role in the regulation of blood glucose, blood pressure, and inflammation, and beyond that, it's also been shown in some studies to have both neuroprotective and cardioprotective effects. Now, looking specifically within the nervous system, we find GLP-1 receptors scattered all throughout different parts of the brain. These are the switches that we talked about earlier in the episode. We find those receptors in parts of the brainstem in areas like the nucleus tractus solitarius, which is involved in hunger and food intake, and the area postrema, which is involved in taste aversion, and sensing nutritional information like signals from the vagus nerve coming up from the GI tract and sensing of hormones like ghrelin, which is a hunger signal that's secreted by the stomach, and then conveying that information to the hypothalamus. So we find these receptors scattered all throughout the central nervous system, and that should tell us that GLP-1 is a really important molecule. So if GLP-1 offers a natural molecule to modulate weight, why can't we just give that? Well, GLP-1 only lasts in the bloodstream for about five minutes before it's broken down by an enzyme called DPP-4, or dipeptidylpeptidase 4. We can inhibit that enzyme to prevent the breakdown of GLP-1, and in fact, we do have drugs that do exactly that. But another way to tackle this problem is to create a lookalike molecule that can activate GLP-1's receptors. And that's exactly what drugs like ozempic, or semaglutide, and loraglutide are doing. These molecules mimic the effects of GLP-1 in the body because their shapes are extremely similar, with the exception that they're modified to either enhance the binding to the receptor or to be resistant to being destroyed by enzymes. Now, whether these drugs actually get into the brain by crossing over the blood-brain barrier used to be a matter of controversy, but we now have good evidence that in fact they do cross over into the central nervous system, and they likely promote weight loss by activating the GLP-1 receptors in those parts of the brain that we mentioned earlier in the episode, like the hypothalamus and the brainstem. So the primary way that these drugs work is likely by decreasing appetite and decreasing energy intake or food intake. So that's the neuroscience. Now how well do these drugs, like semaglutide or the GLP-1 receptor agonists, actually work? Let's take a look at how these drugs affect body weight in real human clinical trials. But first, I'd like to say that none of this is medical advice, and because everyone is different, you should always ask your doctor before making any health decisions, and I also have no affiliation with these drugs or their manufacturers. In 2021, the New England Journal of Medicine published the results of a landmark study called the Step 1 Study, which was a large, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial looking at how semaglutide affected body weight. In this study, the researchers randomized 1,961 adults with either overweight or obesity and without diabetes, the 68 weeks of treatment with either semaglutide plus lifestyle intervention, and that included a reduced calorie diet and exercise, 
or placebo plus lifestyle intervention. And in order to avoid GI side effects, which can be common with these drugs, the dose of semaglutide was started low and escalated every four weeks until the maintenance dose was reached at week 16. At the end of 68 weeks, the group receiving semaglutide and lifestyle intervention had a 14.9% decrease in body weight compared with only 2.4% for the placebo group. So compared to the placebo group, the semaglutide group had a 12.4% greater weight loss over 68 weeks. And beyond losing more weight, the subjects on semaglutide also had improvement in several cardiometabolic risk factors. And those included waist circumference, blood pressure, glycated hemoglobin levels, lipid levels, and C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation, and glucose levels. Now, these results were really encouraging because they showed that semaglutide can likely affect cardiometabolic risk beyond just reducing a number on the scale. Now, since weight regain is such an incredibly challenging problem in the treatment of obesity, a key question is whether the GLP-1 receptor agonists continue to work a few years out from treatment. Just over a year ago, a study called the STEP-5 trial, published in Nature Medicine, taught us three really important things about this. Number one was that weight loss with semaglutide seemed to plateau a little after a year or 68 weeks. Number two was that those weight reductions did in fact persist all the way out to about two years or 104 weeks. And number three was that the improvements in cardiometabolic risk also persisted with longer treatment. Now we do need longer follow-up data, but overall these results are encouraging. Now the next key question is what happens when we take someone off of semaglutide? In 2021, the answer to that question was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The step four trial looked at the effects of stopping semaglutide and in this study, all the participants were started on semaglutide and lifestyle intervention for 20 weeks. And after that initial 20 weeks on the drug, participants were randomized to one of two different options. The first was to continue on the drug or semaglutide plus lifestyle intervention. The second option was to go on to placebo with lifestyle intervention. And it turned out that when participants came off the semaglutide, they regained about 6.9% of their body weight after about a year or 48 weeks. But what if the reason why people regained weight after stopping the drug was that the treatment period just wasn't long enough? Well, the step one trial extension looked at weight regain following an even longer period of semaglutide treatment, withdrawing the drug after 68 weeks instead of 20 weeks. The researchers found that one year out from stopping semaglutide, the participants had regained roughly two thirds of the weight that they had initially lost. As we might expect, the participants who had the most weight regain were the ones who had the most weight loss while on the drug. Now there is a significant issue with this study. The authors wrote that these results highlight the importance of maintaining long-term pharmacologic treatment for weight management in people with obesity. And they may turn out to be entirely correct on that point, and I expect that they may be correct. But unfortunately in this study, along with stopping the drug, the lifestyle recommendations were also stopped, including dietary counseling, and a reduced calorie diet and exercise. So the participants were never really given a fair shot at maintaining their weight loss after they had stopped the drug. Now, before we wrap up, let's talk about some side effects. So GLP-1 agonists make us feel full, and they act on parts of the brainstem that control nausea. So some of the main side effects are GI-related, like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And on occasion, I've seen patients who can't keep anything down after starting these drugs, and those patients can actually get really dehydrated, and that can lead to other problems like kidney injury. But as far as we know, at the time of this recording, people tend to do quite well on these drugs, at least in the short term. An important caveat is that there are some reasons why someone may not want to take a GLP-1 receptor agonist. There are too many to get into here, so please ask your doctor. Some data have suggested that GLP-1 receptor agonists may be associated with an increased risk of certain types of cancer, like thyroid cancer and pancreatic cancer. There's also some reports of pancreatitis on these drugs or gallstones. There are also some reports recently about suicidal ideations while on GLP-1 receptor agonists. In studies of profound weight loss, like the Minnesota starvation experiment, many of these subjects became very depressed. And so it's unclear right now whether these suicidal ideations and or depressive tendencies may be related to the drug itself or due to the rapid weight loss that has occurred. So let's recap. The first take home point is that these drugs, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, act on the brain and are remarkably effective at helping people to lose weight. The next is that they also seem to be meaningfully effective at modifying cardiometabolic risk factors. And third, when people come off of these drugs, 
weight regain is common. We'll need longer term data to see exactly where that weight regain plateaus. If you want to know more about the neuroscience of appetite regulation and how the brain regulates body fat, I'll link to our previous video in the description. I'd also highly recommend reading a book called The Hungry Brain by Dr. Stefan Guillenet. It's really one of the best resources for someone who wants to learn about the neuroscience of appetite regulation and energy balance. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to support this channel, the very best way to do that is to hit the subscribe button and the like button. Head over to nicksterling.com where you can find the sign up for the newsletter. You can find me on all the major platforms with the ID Sterling NDPHD. Thanks again for listening. And we'll see you next time. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and should not be interpreted as medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. You should not attempt to implement any of the topics or concepts discussed on this podcast without the direct approval and supervision of your own physician. This podcast should not take precedence over the information provided to you by your healthcare provider or official public health sources. Please visit nicksterling.com for relevant disclosures and full terms of use.